Welcome to session five of The Greatest Journey called Wounds and Walls. This is part two. And in this session, we're gonna dive into the root to fruit connection of Hebrews 12, 15. The goal this session is to take the wounds and walls terms from last session and begin to personalize them, apply them to our own stories. To do this, we're gonna walk through some really practical exercises, including the bitterness tree and faces of my past where we summarize and clearly define the pain we've experienced with the most important people in our lives, as well as the pain we're causing to ourselves and others today. All of this is gonna set us up to write our life story. I'm gonna explain that at the end of the session, and then I'm gonna read my own life story as an example. This is a very important step in your journey, so let's get started in session five. Well, welcome to session five. This is Wounds and Walls, part two. And we're gonna get started at the top of page 36. Last week, part one, we talked about uh, these practical terms of the five primary areas of wounding and also the walls that we put up to protect ourselves from the wounding that we uh, endure from other people in our, in our past, in our childhood. So. That was just setting the stage, getting the terms down. This week, we're gonna personalize it. Okay, which terms apply to your story? What does that mean? What does it look like? And then which specific walls did you put up? How's that affected you? And how is that affecting other people around you? Um, now look at this scripture. We've, we've read this, I've said it many times over the last four weeks, but Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The whole theme of this session is gonna be root to fruit. We're gonna look at this tree, the root to fruit tree. And the whole concept is here, this is a summary here at the top of page 36 under that scripture, is that these unhealed pain, this unhealed wounds in close family relationships in our early years causes painful memories, bitter emotions, uh, that stay with us all the way into adulthood if they're not revealed and healed. And this is the root structure for everything that we're experiencing today, all of the fruit that we have to deal with and that other people around us have to deal with. It's all coming from this root structure. And here's the big idea. Root pain and fruit behaviors are directly connected. It's all one, one connected tree. Here's the key though trying to manage that fruit, trying to manage the fruit of toxic behavior without addressing the bitter root that's causing it brings disappointment, hopelessness, and weariness. How many of you have ever been exhausted from trying to change things? Over, read a book, go to a seminar, oh, go to a 10-week course called The Greatest Journey, right? And you're just like, please, God. And hopelessness can start to creep in because you, your hope starts to get stripped out because every time you go to do this, if it's not working, a little relief may come, a little bit of change for a while, but then if stuff doesn't radically transform, we start to lose a little bit of hope that this could happen. What happens when you lose hope? You settle for less than what Jesus died to give you. You settle for a certain level of pain that's manageable that you can figure out how to cope with. The problem is, if we settle, we can't step into the more, we can't step into our calling, our destiny, into our full identity and do what we're called to do. Now, I want to remind you, no one else, no one else is in control of whether or not you get healed or in control of whether or not you step into the fullness of what God has for you. It doesn't matter who has abused you. It doesn't matter who has said what in your life. It doesn't matter, listen to this, it doesn't matter if you feel like you've lost the last 20 years. It doesn't matter. This is the only ministry I know of. How many saw Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox in the 80s? The flux capacitor is awesome. It's sci-fi. This is real sci-fi because the ministry of reconciliation time travels up and back the, down the generations. It goes back up the family tree and it goes down into the generations. And you can't lose 20 years that God won't redeem and make up for a whole lot faster than you even realize, okay? So don't get stuck on what you've lost or your circumstances or what someone did or took from you. Don't stay there. 
I get it, it hurts really, really bad. It really stinks. I've had those same years of regret. But nothing is transformed until we step past that and go, okay, God, I trust your ability to redeem all of this and to transform me from the inside out. And it will, he will do it. All right, so here we're going to, bottom of page 36, we're going to look at this tree, fruit behaviors and root wounds. So this is an illustration. This is all filled out. And I'm going to show this up on the big screen. And you're going to see it in your book, but also here. And you're going to see this. You've got these, remember the primary wounds, the five primary wounds that we talked about last week. They're down here in the root structure. And then up here up top, we've got fruit behaviors. These are toxic behaviors that come after years of bitterness and unforgiveness, vengeance. Here's the, uh, the action that hurts us and hurts other people. Remember we said there's exploding and imploding rage. So you're going to see both here. You're also going to see unintentional and intentional <coughs> wounding here that causes both unintentional and intentional fruit behaviors. They're all connected. So let's look at a few of these. All right. And you can take notes, write in your own thoughts as we go. Look at number one here at the bottom, rejection. What does it correspond to in fruit behaviors up top? Depression. Why would someone be depressed? What's the mechanics of that? What, what leads to depression? I mean, there's a lot of things that can lead to depression. Poor self-esteem, right? What, what is depression? It's a heaviness. Say that again. Emotion turned inward. Yeah, you just, it's a deflation. There's not the, 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 the strength on the inside of identity and confidence and hope and, and vision and looking forward. Why? Something's been deflated. I think of the little girl that is five years old, like my daughter, who wanted to come into Papa's office today and give him something that she actually probably made for who knows who, but she all of a sudden now, I made it for you, Papa, right? And he turns around, right, and engages with her, but he knows to do that. But I didn't always do that. How many times did my sons or, or, or when they were little come up to me, and I think of the little girl that Dad's on the phone after a really hard day, just trying to unwind, flipping through the news or through social media, just trying to unplug. And the girl's trying to get his attention and then pulls down the phone. He's not answering. And instead of, hey, baby, what do you need? It's, what are you doing? What? Don't touch my phone, right? Frustration. Now, that's on a bad day. If it was another day and there wasn't the stress and the anxiety and the difficulty and the needing to unwind, then it would maybe be a different reaction or response but that day he gets on to her all she wanted was a little bit of his attention she wanted something from him and on that day he was not able to give what she wanted or to give what she needed what's the message we said comes when there's not mutuality in a relationship the automatic message is what if I want more from you than you're able to give to me and it's not mutual in that moment whether you intended to or didn't intend rejection. rejection. It's the core root wound of every other wound. That's what everything goes back to. And so it's a devaluing. Abandonment is also a devaluing. It's a form of rejection, but it's a devaluing of the person. In this moment, what I'm paying attention to, I'm choosing over you. And it may be small, but what if over the next year, two or three or 10 or 15, that same lie gets echoed by other people or by the same person around them over and over and over. What does somebody begin? What does that little girl begin to believe as she comes into her into womanhood? I, yeah, I don't matter. I don't have a voice. No one's listening to me. I'm not important. Is any of that true? What if she knows it's not true? But what's in her belief structure from a little girl? what was actually fed to her and written in her base code by the most important people in her life. And it just starts with these little moments. That's why we don't devalue those little glimpses of a memory. And you go, man, I don't feel a whole lot of pain with that, but that seems really important. That's because it is. It all feeds into these core lies. So depression, number two, abandonment. What's the fruit of abandonment here? 
What do we see? Why would I have controlling behavior if I've been abandoned? What do you think? You feel out of control, like somebody's forming your world for you, They're right? And when I get older, I control things so that what doesn't happen? Yeah, so I don't get abandoned again. I, I'm going to set the stage so nobody else can mess with the pieces, right? I don't want to be out of control, right? It makes sense. You know, there's a lot of other fruit that can come from these things. This isn't saying that this is the only fruit. For instance... Um, the, uh, a little girl, instead of being controlling, could be promiscuous or could, could just look for value from men or same thing, the opposite gender. It doesn't matter. We can look for value from other people where we've been missing it in our past. All kinds of fruit. It depends on, on what we do with it in our hearts. What about number three, detachment? What's the result of de- detachment? Frozen emotions, right? Hard time connecting. You ever heard somebody say, I just, I don't really fit in. I just have a hard time connecting with the girls or hard time connecting with the guys. It's, it's just not my thing, mm-hmm. right? Is that really not any of our thing? Were any of us not made for connection? Is another human being, did God make a human being to not be connected? No. It's not that it's not our thing. It's that we don't, we don't, We don't know how to get there. Or maybe it doesn't feel natural because we didn't grow up understanding how to do it. And so it it may feel unnatural. All right, number four, physical abuse leads to violence, angry outbursts. These next ones, uh, many times what was sown in is in the root structure will lead sometimes to the exact same behavior at at the fruit level. So angry outbursts, a result of physical abuse or more physical abuse. Uh, Number five, sexual abuse leads to shame, can lead to rage and self-harm. You know, one of the scripts of sexual abuse is it happens, we hide it in shame, but we act out because we want somebody to come in and look and find it because we just want help, but we don't know how to get it. And if if nobody's going to feel my pain, I'm going to make you feel my pain. If nobody's going to pay attention, I'm going to make you pay attention. Um, Arson. Many times arsonists have been the victim of sexual abuse. The fire of rage burns on the inside of a person, and that's the very fruit that they pour out. Um, it's, It's, remember last week when we said the root reveals the fruit and the fruit reveals the root? So you can look at the behavior of someone who's in a lot of pain and you can recognize pretty quickly generally what's gone on. Sometimes it doesn't even take, it doesn't take a word of knowledge. You just know after you've done this long enough or you've seen it or you've experienced it in your own life. Oh man, it's the wisdom of God because then you know what to ask people. Then you know how to sit with people and not waste words and how to listen and not make assumptions just because of their behavior, right? Same thing for ourselves. Number six, verbal berating. Now, this is a funny one. Verbal berating leads to deception. What's the connection there? Why would verbal berating lead to the fruit of deceptive behavior or lying? What's, what's up with that? Anybody get, take a stab at that one? Well, if I'm, yeah, go ahead. Right. And maybe dad was always putting them down for not being perfect or right. or whatever. And then, then when they get older, they, they try to be somebody else. They try to be something that they're not? Yes. Yeah. And what are they trying to do by becoming something that they're not? Avoid what? Criticism. Yeah. Criticism, being berated. Uh, being deceptive, too. If, if, if I'm a teenager or a young adult that lies and is very deceptive and kind of shifty and shady or maybe even in business practices, well, that's a form of, I mean, if you were being berated by someone, wouldn't you want to do whatever smokescreen you had to do to get out from, anybody here ever been berated on a regular basis? It's so painful. It's so painful. You're not being hit, but it's like every last nerve on the inside, all, all of your emotions are just being pounded on 
with criticism. And so whatever it takes to get out from behind that, even if I have to lie, even if I have to say, no, 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 it wasn't me. I didn't do that. Um, it's, it's a form of protecting ourselves from further pain, okay? Are you guys, I know you guys see this, but as we're doing this, do you see some of your own story in here a little bit? Can you see how things connect? We're going to get to that here on the next page, 37. And you're going to want to refer back to your timeline on this exercise. So you're going to see a blank root to fruit tree here on page 37, and we're going to fill this out. We're going to take about 10 minutes here. And we're going to do this little exercise where you actually write in from your timeline or whatever you remember, even that you didn't put on your timeline. You're going to write in the, the root wounds that are in your story. Give it language. You know, name the pain. We want to, we want to name it, call it what it is, so that it doesn't hide in confusion uh, or hide in, you know, just kind of uh, generalities. We want to call it what it is. And we want to put that there in the roots. And then what I want you to do is don't necessarily try to make the connection, but just write the fruit behaviors in that you see in your own life over the last six months or whatever. Write those things in that you still struggle with, even if it's on a heart level. Maybe it's not a behavior that somebody else would be able to pinpoint, but it's stuff that's going on inside of your heart or mind. Maybe it's sleeplessness. Maybe it's uh, anxiety or mistrust towards God or somebody else. I mean, it's just things that other people wouldn't see. Make sure you write those in because those are fruit as well. Um, examples of root structure, a parent's divorce, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, dad was always gone, mom was depressed. You may not have a, a wound word for it, but you can say what happened in the roots, okay? If, you, if you're looking for a word, just maybe say what happened. Don't get stuck, okay? And then when you're finished filling that out, we'll take about 10 minutes, then answer this question at the bottom of 37. It, it asks, uh, take another look at the keywords and phrases. Can you see any connections where a root wound might be the cause of a fruit behavior in your life today? And then describe that connection that you notice, okay? Does everybody understand any questions about this? Good, I didn't think so. Let's take 10 minutes and go through it. Let's move on to page 38. Again, guys, we're still laying some foundation for the, the first major assignment. This is just starting to peel things back a little bit. Uh, I want you to think a little deeper. Some of you are already there. Some of you just need a little more time in the crock pot. All right, the big lie, page 38. Um, we're gonna answer a couple questions and then we'll talk about the big lie. But I want you to Take a minute, think about the different relationships in your life, and this is not just in your family. Coworkers, teachers, coaches, uh, bosses, I mean, employers. Think of all the different relationships. Does a memory of any one of them bring up feelings of hurt, bitterness, or anger? Like when you think of a name in your cell phone or um, somebody at work, is there any bitterness, any frustration, anger, detachment, like, uh, I don't want to have anything to do with them. If no, check no. If yes, write down their, their names, at least a first name. Okay, and now is there, a, is there one of these relationships, a parent, sibling, or friend that you should feel close to? I mean, maybe you even act like everything's okay, but you should definitely feel close to them because of the relationship, or you want to feel close to them, but you don't. Um, you maybe you feel detached, distant, or walled off from somebody who should be a core relationship. If yes, write down their name. All right, so think, think about that person, and we want to talk about this big lie, but the setup is we justify um, feelings of bitterness or unforgiveness and feel like because of what they did or didn't do, but usually what they did, uh, justifies us feeling the way we feel and treating them the way that we do until they come and make it right or say they're sorry or uh, come here baby oh I love your purple hair that's gorgeous I love you good night and so we we justify it and say well 
it's okay, and we build a wall with that person, and not saying this is not about healthy boundaries, okay? There are healthy boundaries. I'm talking about a wall of protection because of deep-rooted bitterness and offense, and I want them to either pay for what they've done or they need to come and, and apologize to me, and we say that it's okay, but here's the thing. We feel like, and you'll see this here right above the big lie, we feel like and we think it won't affect us, uh, won't affect us or any of our other relationships. Okay, here's what the lie is. Look at this. The lie that we bite into when we position ourselves like this towards a person is that bitterness towards the person who hurt me doesn't affect my other relationships. I can separate that pain and wall off from only them. So we, we feel like we can compartmentalize that issue and it's over here and then I'm going to go over here and have my relationship with God and I'm going to have my relationship with my family and other people. Meanwhile, there's deep bitterness towards this one person, but that's okay. It's contained. Okay. Why is that a lie? Well, let's hold that up against Scripture. Look at this passage out of 1 John 2. He who says that he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Now catch this. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What we call this is bitter blind and bitter bind. We're blinded by bitterness and then bitterness binds us in darkness. That's how it works. And we're usually not aware of bitterness because the nature of bitterness is gall or an anesthetizing agent. It's supposed to numb things. So we don't even know that it's there. It's like pride. You don't know that it's there. That's the whole point. And so when we're bitter towards someone, we don't know. And we have to judge by uh, our, our behavior, our feelings, how we treat them. And we have to ask the Lord. That's why we say, show me what I don't see. Search my heart. And so the truth is, let's look at the truth. All of our relationships are connected vertically and horizontally. We talked about this. Remember the flow of freedom, session one? All of our relationships are connected. Bitterness towards a single person affects all of my relationships with people, with myself, and with God. Page 39 and 40 is your next exercise here. This is called Faces of My Past. And you're going to pinpoint two specific relationships. Now, I've given you two pages. You may have like five or six that you want to do or seven. Use different colored ink, do cursive for one, print for the other, whatever it takes, or photocopy this and, you know, whatever, however many you need. Um, my suggestion is that you start with biological mom, biological dad, and then move from there. Why? Because we heal from the foundation up. In other words, we heal in sequence. Did we talk about this yet? You might, you might say, well, mom and dad were not in my life. I had caregivers. I had, uh, you know, different, different situation, grandma, grandpa. Okay. You still need to make sure you address mom and dad, because let's say dad was not in the picture from early on. That's still a wound. There's still an abandonment. You need to make sure you address that. But if grandpa was the primary caregiver, then start with grandpa, okay, and then move on from there. Um, if you've got more than two primary people who really set your DNA emotionally and set your DNA in your soul, then maybe it was three, then include those three people in Faces of My Past, but do at least two. You're going to name them. What was their primary, secondary impact from the family profile? So go back to that. How, was, how were you hurt? This is the seed of offense. Was it unintentional or intentional? Those are the core wounds. Um, how did you hide the pain? Uh, this is the root of bitterness. Where did you go with it? And then the fruit of behavior. I'm causing pain to self and others. So you're just going to go through, fill this out for each person. Anybody have any questions? Some of you have been through something like this before, so this is 
uh, it's you're a few many layers deep into this and some of you this is your very first time and this is it's more painful it's more difficult and so everybody's in a different place but go home find a quiet place this is step one on the top of page 41 I will reveal pain instead of detaching from God and others. We're going to write our life story 0 to 18, whatever we have knowledge of or we remember. And these are going to be your painful memories. This is not, every, this is not like your timeline, good and bad. This is a record of the pain that you went through from 0 to 18. Here's what I want you to write. You're going to reveal what happened and that it hurt. And you can look at the little bullet points here. No generalities, be specific. Identify each painful event as you can remember it, including what was said. Who caused the pain? Identify the source. And then how did it make you feel? Identify what you actually felt. What was the pain? What was the wound? Step three, be willing and free. Look at this. To grieve a godly sorrow over the painful things that have happened to you. And resist the temptation to be tough. There's some scriptures there I want you to read when you get to that point. When you sit down and you pray and you talk to the Father and you start to write, read through these. When you write it, when you, uh, when you write it you're going to be thinking about it. You're going to be thinking about what happened. Some of the pain may come up. But when you come back next week and you read it to one other trusted person, you're going to feel it. It's going to connect more. And so just know that that's the process. You may be writing something that you're not even really feeling that much about, but then when you go to read it, it's like, whoa. And look, what does a godly sorrow look like? As long as you're open and you're not trying to just muscle through it and keep it together, but you really tr truly are willing to feel the pain that was there that you never allowed yourself to feel, then it'll happen the way that it's supposed to happen. I mean, I've seen people just barely... Just, just grieve for just a little bit something that happened and get completely set free. Man, God rewards the humble, guys. He, he resists who? But who does he draw near to? Who's he close to? Yeah. We want to be close to him because that's where the freedom is. All right. I'm going to read my, uh, this short version of my own life story so you guys can kind of see what this sounds like. All right. I remember being spanked a lot at home. The older I got, the more mad I got when my dad spanked me. I can remember lots of times where I either ran away from him or got spanked and then ran off saying, I hate you, I hate you. And then I'd go into my room, grab a pillow and scream into it, and cuss my dad out. One of my most, pain, uh, most vivid painful memories happened when I was 12 or so. I was getting ready to go on my first plane ride to see my grandparents. I was scared that I would get lost in the airport and wanted to know how to find my way if that happened. My dad was trying to explain how the terminal screens worked, but I wasn't seeing it and I began to get really worked up. That's so stupid, he said. Why can't you understand something so simple? I began to cry and out of frustration, he grabbed my shoulders, pushed me up against the wall and yelled, stop crying, there's no reason to cry. In sixth grade, I got spanked at school so hard that my backside turned black and blue. When I screamed, I remember the principal saying, oh, stop your yelling, it ain't that bad. After that, I remember making a decision to do whatever I had to do to not get into trouble and not make people mad. But I still had big rage issues at home. I can remember fighting with my brother once and getting so mad that when my mom intervened, I yelled at him, if I had a shotgun right now, I'd blow your head off. One day I was really angry at my dad. I was in the living room and no one was around. And in a fit of rage, I told the devil that he could come into my life, that he could have me. I remember thinking it was the most rebellious thing that I could do, so that's what I did. And stuff got really bad after that. Any time that my brothers left the house to hunt or ride bikes, I was right on their tail trying to keep up. But most of the time they were trying to get rid of me. So they'd find a way to outrun me and hide or climb a big tree and wait until I went home. One time they ran down to the creek and crossed the big drainage pole over the water. And when they got to the other side, this is true, uh, they all peed on the pole so I wouldn't try to scoot across and follow. I went back to the house alone and mad. 
Uh, sometimes they'd let me tag along, but most of the time I was too little or too slow to keep up, and I often felt like I didn't belong. When my parents would go out on dates, my brothers loved to turn off lights, scare me, hide behind things, and pop out. One night they locked themselves in one of their rooms so I couldn't get in, and then they climbed out the window. Once I'd finally picked the lock and opened the door, they were gone. I remember sitting in the living room panicked and crying because I knew they were somewhere just waiting to scare me. Suddenly the lights went off, the whole living room was dark, I started bawling and screaming. They came out yelling and laughing and I was really mad once the lights came back on. I always felt like such a baby when I, when I would end up crying like that, but I hated that feeling of being alone and, and knowing they were out there just waiting to sneak up on me. As I got older, I found it hard to relate to the guys. I was always very insecure. Around boys my age or older, I acted out either with rage by fighting or with sarcasm and making fun of people. I can remember being a, ch a children's church volunteer, <coughs> volunteer when I was in junior high. I used to help with bus routes, puppets, stage crew stuff, but I was always the youngest and littlest kid helping. All the other kids were in high school. One time, the high school guys grabbed me and put me into the trunk of a car, drove around Cedar Hill for a while. I remember thinking that I'd be okay but I felt pretty out of control and just embarrassed and picked on. It was basically more of what I got at home. When I was 10 or 11 years old, I was in the church sanctuary with my children's pastor. He was giving me a piano lesson, and at one point he smiled at me, and then he touched me inappropriately. About two years later, I was volunteering at a camp with this man, and he exposed himself to me in the guy's bathroom as he was getting out of the shower. Again, he just stood and smiled at me. Both, both times I remember thinking that I had probably done something wrong and I felt embarrassed and ashamed, so I turned around and walked away, but I didn't tell anyone about it. Throughout junior high and high school, my dad got frustrated with me when I asked for help with my homework. Pretty much every time we'd get about five minutes into things, he would end up rolling his eyes and huffing in frustration because I wouldn't get something or wouldn't understand what he was trying to explain. I remember feeling really dumb when that happened. The looks of disapproval, anger, and frustration that my dad gave me were painful, as were the intense spankings. But now that I'm an adult, I realize that the most painful thing was that my dad didn't show me affection. He didn't pull me up into his, his lap and hug me and tell me that he loved me. He was often distant and quiet. It was hard to get his attention when he was reading or doing something. If I did something with him, I often felt in the way or incompetent to help. This is, the, this is the part of it where we get really, really vulnerable. We get really real. I'm not going to make you stand up and do this like I'm doing it and read this in front of everybody. Don't get nervous. Next week, you're going to just find a person you trust and read it. It could be me. It could be my parents or Katie if, if Trinity's in bed uh, or anyone else in here. There's been times I've, pull, I've written letters that were so intense, I just pulled up a chair and read it to Jesus. Literally, just close my eyes and well, I didn't close my eyes because you got to read. <laughs> but I'm just like, he's right here with me and I'm going to read it to him like he's my best friend. And it was the same level of freedom. So I'm not saying do that next week. You can't cop out and go find an empty chair. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. But that's what we're going to do, okay? Any questions? about what we're doing this week. I think that's it. Really thankful for those of you that are watching this online. Next week, we'll be back for session six.